My name is John Beckford. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean here at Furman University. And I want to welcome you to tonight's program. It's uh, really our privilege at Furman University to sponsor another one of a long series of events that have been uh, produced exclusively through the Riley Institute at Furman University. For those of you who are participating in our first O'Reilly Institute event in, in your careers here, uh, let me just take, ask you to take a moment uh, to read the description of what the Riley Institute does. I will read a little bit to you, uh, reminding you that the Riley Institute is um, an institute of government, politics, and public leadership in a multifaceted and nonpartisan institute affiliated with our Department of Political Science. Since 1999, when this uh, institute was created, it has really established a whole new dimension to this, in, uh, to this institution, Furman University. And along the way, we have decided that uh, there's a variety of activities that uh, deserve the kind of public discourse and uh, convening opportunities that, the, public, that uh, the Riley Institute can bring uh, to this campus. And some of those long-standing now uh, activities have included the Riley Institute's uh, Art Teachers of Government and Emerging Public Leaders programs, uh, the Wilkins Excellence in Legislative Leadership program, Law and Society series, as well as the award-winning Riley Diversity Initiative uh, uh, program. Uh, these really have been made possible because of the inspiration of its founder uh, and its namesake, uh, Richard W. Riley, our former South Carolina governor and the Secretary of Education under both terms of the Clinton uh, administration. Rarely will you see uh, a secretary serve out two full terms under a presidency that goes that long, uh, but he was so effective in that role and continues to be a major leader uh, in education uh, throughout not only the United States, but uh, as an example of uh, good leadership in education throughout the entire world. Tonight's program is uh, one of a series that we've done over the last several years, uh, highlighting uh, visitors that we've had through the Woodrow Wilson uh, Fellows Program. And to let you know that our guest is in a rather illustrious company of people, including um, our uh, Phil Later, Madeline Coonan, uh, we have uh, the ambassadors to Finland, ambassadors to Burkina Faso in Colombia, uh, China, ambassador to the United Kingdom, Canada and Poland. Uh, these individuals have enlightened our institution and the greater Greenville community with their presence. Uh, one of the reasons we have the Woodrow Wilson Fellows Program here at Furman is because um, one of my predecessors, uh, Dr. A.B. Huff, the former dean, and we owe a great debt to him for making certain that Furman had access to Woodrow Wilson Fellows. To introduce tonight's speaker, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Danielle Vinson. Dr. Vinson is not only a professor of political science at Furman, but she also serves as the department's chair. So thank you for being here, Danielle. Good evening. For those of us who study media and politics like I do, and for some of you who enjoy media and politics, the News Hour on public television is a welcome alternative to the high volume, low information politics frequently found on cable news. And for that reason, I am especially happy that this evening's speaker is with us. Jeffrey Brown is co-anchor and senior correspondent for the NewsHour. He's worked there for more than 20 years in a variety of roles, on camera and off. He's interviewed leading newsmakers and conducted studio discussions on a, a variety of topics, and he's reported from around the United States and the world. As arts correspondent, he's profiled and interviewed many of the world's leading writers, musicians, and other artists. And as senior producer for National Affairs, he's helped shape the program's coverage of the economy, health care, social policy, and culture, among other issues. He's also the creator and host of Artbeat, the NewsHour's online arts and culture blog. His work as correspondent and producer has garnered an Emmy, six Cena Gold, Golden Eagle Awards, among other honors. And he proves weekly that one can elicit interesting discussions and highlight opposing perspectives without raising one's voice and insulting the guests or the audience. <laughs> Tonight, he will be joining us to talk about the public voice in a divided America. Please welcome Jeffrey Brown. Well, 
thank you for that, and thank you for all coming out. You know, one of the things that happens when I do this, I'm, I'm in a television studio most nights, and you're looking into a camera, and you don't quite know who's out there. You don't actually see real people. So the first thing that happens when I do this is, real people, hello. <laughs> I don't usually get to say hello when we start, uh, when we start the newscast. Um, this is my first time as a Woodrow Wilson Fellow. This is my first experience. They asked me to do this last year, and I thought it would be fun to do, and I knew it would be hard to do given the schedule, um, but this was the first chance I got. And I must say the bar is awfully high because this has been a wonderful couple of days here. I want to first thank everybody at, here at, at Furman for the very warm embrace. It's been a little odd for a couple of days because I arrived I got uh, a cold over the weekend, and I arrived here not feeling well. So I have been walking around this beautiful campus for two days with a red nose, you know, and dark shadows under my eyes, thinking, where's the makeup person? Because <laughs> one of the things I got used to, I, as, as you heard, I spent part of my career behind the camera, and then I went on camera. So I sort of learned these things about what is it like to be on television. Well, one is you have to be very unselfconscious about being made up. So I find myself all these years later sort of annoyed, like, where's the makeup person? You know? <laughs> I also have um, been suffering a little with my voice. And that you will still hear. So I ask your indulgence. I'm going to speak a little, little more slowly than normal. And I'm going to drink water as much as I can. Um, but one of the nice things has happened, you know, in two days, uh, I've gotten to know so many new people. I've, this has been an intense experience. And everywhere I look, I see people that I've been spending time with. And there's been so much concern. This has been sort of a running narrative of my visit is how are you feeling? And so people come up to me who I didn't know, you know, 24 hours ago as, as, as very close friends now. And I've heard, you know, you, you sound better, but you still look like crap, you know? <laughs> and I've heard, oh, you look better, but your voice is still pretty bad. So I've heard it all, and I told my wife last night, boy, the, the attention, the personal attention I, is way more than I get at home. So I, <laughs> I appreciate that. More important, the embrace that I, that I get here is from the students, many of them here, and from the faculty from um, a, a first breakfast with, and a dinner, and then a breakfast with faculty, and the many classes that I've been able to go to. And there's been so many interesting conversations about government and politics and the, uh, the arts, and of course the role of education, and of course media. So I wanna, I'm gonna pick up on some of those themes that we've been talking about here, that I've been talking about the last couple of days, and I'll talk at you for a little bit, and then I hope we can open it up for some questions, because frankly, to me, I mean, these conversations with students and faculty have been what this makes it so interesting for me. I want to start by taking you to a, a kind of strange, almost surreal moment for me that happened in the last couple of months. I was in Wisconsin to report on the recall election of Governor Scott Walker. And, um, for those of you who follow these things, uh, Wisconsin's been in a, you know, we're right in the middle of a big, you know, political battle right now, of course, nationally. But Wisconsin has been in the middle of this for two years and running, since uh, 2000, since 2010, when Scott Walker took over and the entire uh, legislature flipped from Democratic to Republican. And then immediately there was a recall uh, push, and there's been sort of a warfare there for a couple of years that um, is a kind of microcosm of what's going on in the country. So I was there and we were reporting on this story and we were driving back at the end of a long day from um, outside Milwaukee towards the city on the interstate to, to, to finish our day, frankly. And uh, ahead of us on an overpass, we saw uh, a whole group of people over the interstate um, holding up signs, shouting, jumping up and down. Um, they were supporters of Governor Walker, and they were clearly having a great time. And it was as rowdy and raucous as you want to see, you know, in, in a political situation. And um, they were perched up there on this, if you can picture, a, you know, it's not a, 
it's not a driveway, it's a walkway over an interstate. So you're actually, you're sort of up there, but you're really close to the traffic that's coming below you. And we decided we just had to check this out. You know, this wasn't something we could just let go by. So we got off at the next exit and we made our way back. And it, um, it really was quite a scene to be up there because uh, it was almost like you could reach down and touch those tall trucks that are, that are coming along uh, on the interstate. And at the same time, you're sort of ex out there in space, you know, so there's the wind blowing and the constant movement of the vehicles below and the sky above. And because it was a Scott Walker group, Republicans and conservatives and Tea Party, um, they were holding up signs to that effect. And um, the drivers coming along were reacting in kind. So many would, would honk their horns and give them a big thumbs up, you know. And um, they'd all jump and down, it was get very exciting. Other people would honk their horns and hold up a certain other finger, <laughs> which I won't do myself. But it was a moment there where you saw the kind of rowdiness and the um, animation of what's been happening in a state that's been in this political turmoil and the feelings and the tensions were running so high. And so for me, you know, there was a moment where it was all there, this the rush of the wind and the noise of the traffic and the exuberance of a grassroots rally, um, the very strong feelings for and against, all right there. So a kind of perfect moment, a perfect moment of a divided and partly exuberant but partly angry America. And one other just little side note that was quite interesting is, and this has now happened to me a number of times, but interviewing people up there who were wearing big badges that say, don't trust the mainstream or the lamestream media. You know, and of course, that's me. <laughs> they seem to act without irony when I start asking them questions. They just answer and I want to say, don't you see that badge you're wearing? <laughs> so if that's politics in 2012, I want to, let's start by agreeing that there's nothing wrong with partisan and passionate political debate and participation. And indeed, there is so much that is right about it. It's really one of the wonders of our system that citizens will get themselves worked up behind a candidate or an issue or a cause and organize themselves and join political parties or start their own versions of political parties. And our elections are fought out this way and they're not decided by guns or mandates from a dictator and that's such a wonderful and remarkable thing. There are always other factors at work of course and, and there's the machinery of the parties that help determine some of these things and there's money which of course is a big factor. Um, but the exuberance that I saw on that walkway pro and con um, that, that walkway over the interstate was American politics at grassroots level. And at its best, this is what politics is about, this in, these engaged and energized citizens, including the ones who were protesting from their you know, trucks and not agreeing with what they were saying. And yet, I think we're here tonight, and the subject is because there is a strong sense and much evidence to support it that our partisanship and our divisions have gone beyond the normal give and take. And they're impacting our ability to govern, and perhaps even more important, our sense of ourselves as Americans. The Washington Post and Kaiser Family Foundation recently published uh, findings of a, of a poll about partisanship in today's politics. And the results, it said, I'm just quoting here, underscore that the gulf between Republicans and Democrats has never been wider. Partisan polarization now presents a potentially insurmountable barrier to governing for whoever wins the White House in November. Now that's a pretty jarring statement if you think about the problems facing all of us. The study went on to say that partisan polarization once was considered an affliction only of elected off officials and political elites. Now it has gone mainstream. Citizens' ties to their political parties are stronger than ever and passions on issues are intensely felt. Now that part interests me a lot as somebody who watches these things and tries to observe people because I wonder if people's ties to the parties are stronger than ever 
or their ties to narrower and very specific issues are stronger than ever, and sort of keeping them focused only on those issues. Perhaps it's a distinction without a difference when it comes time to vote. But among the main areas of the divisions that were cited, and these things you can imagine, attitudes about the federal government, the size of government. The study said that the two parties are miles apart on whether it is better to have smaller government with fewer services or bigger government with more services. That puts it pretty bluntly. There was divisions on whether deficit reduction is more important than spending money in an effort to create jobs. And of course, there are many divisions on religious and social issues, including gay marriage, abortion, guns. And then there was this paragraph near the end that really caught my attention. And it said, and I will quote this because it's important, a key area where both Republicans and Democrats see the world the same way, the same way, though from totally different perspectives, is a shared sense of being at risk of losing what they have. Almost identical percentages, around 6 and 10 in each party, say that groups and people who hold values similar to theirs are losing influence in American life. Six in 10 from both parties think that they're losing influence. They're losing power. They're losing something of value that they see of value in American life. In other words, each side sees itself under siege. And each size, side sees itself and people they identify with as losing. Now, that seems kind of odd, almost impossible, because they both, they both can't be right. Or can they? And that, to me, is one of the riddles of the situation that we're in right now. Can both be right that they're actually losing out to the other, or losing some sense of the American dream? Now, some perspective is in order and allows me to tell you a little bit about myself. I, I have something flying around me. <laughs> I, I graduated from high school in 1974. And many of you will know what that means. It means during my high school years, uh, and before, there were huge battles in the country and divisions over the Vietnam War. Uh, I grew up in near a city with a very large university presence, that's Boston, and it was not unusual at all for me in my years in high school to witness and even attend large demonstrations and see people very passionate and very divided over something. Um, I also remember, as a kid, watching the wild Democratic Convention in 1968, and certainly wilder than anything we experienced recently in Tampa or Charlotte, uh, where Clint Eastwood talking to a chair was probably the strangest and most you know, excitingly odd thing that occurred. And it was odd almost because it was, it was unscripted, because we're so used to these things being un, so scripted and nothing unexpected happened. Well, if you think back to 1968, it was the exact opposite of that. In many ways, these earlier conventions, 68 and others, were a completely different kind of event than we have now, with divisions right before the eyes of millions <coughs> uh, watching on TV, including me as a, as a youngster. And then there was Watergate, uh, which unfolded during my high school years, and revelations about dirty tricks and more at the highest level of government. Uh, it was two months after my graduation in August, it was in August 1974 that Richard Nixon resigned from the presidency. So that, in a sense, was my political coming of age. My first votes as a citizen came after that. And I have to tell you that those events left me incredibly disillusioned, me and many, 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 many people, disillusioned, to say the least. Um, not trusting government, not trusting Washington, does that sound familiar? You know, it led to a country divided, political parties that developed more extreme wings, uh, changes in voting patterns, many of which are still with us today. And I'm not a presidential historian or a political historian, but I know that history provides many other examples of divisive politics, legislators dueling and coming to blows, you know, a divided union, and of course, at most extreme civil war. So perspective on these things is always extremely important. The country goes through cycles of war and peace and relative calm and chaos and political calm and political chaos. And I don't know if this is just another one of those cycles or something bigger is going on. But I want to try to give you some observations to help think about that. 
from where I sit in Washington, the hardening of divisions that are talked about, that so many people see and worry about and sometimes feel contempt for um, and are turned off by, well, a lot of that is real, it's quite real. I recently had occasion to speak separately and privately to, with two former congressmen, one Democrat and one Republican, both very distinguished and accomplished in their day, not so long ago, both very strong fighters for their belief, which as far as I remember was quite often the opposite from one another. But each said to me the exact same thing. The last thing that they would want to do would be to be, to, to be back in Congress because they spoke of the ugliness of much of the political, of political life today. And they both still live in Washington, so they're very much aware of it. The lack of the forthright discussions that they were familiar with and enjoyed, you know, partaking with the other side, even the lack of sort of friendliness across the aisle and a sense of shared goals across party lines. And so we see it now in, in, in every piece of legislation. These days it's news when an important piece of any of legislation passes with any members of one party voting with the other. Compromise seems to be a dirty word. And recently we interviewed two senators who decided not to seek re-election, in large part because they, they don't like the atmosphere and they don't see the Senate as a place to get things done, the Senate, the great deliberative body of our, of our democracy. Now, one was a Republican, Olympia Snow, and she said, I'm quoting, people view compromise with disdain. Somehow it's viewed as capitulation of your principles, and it's not. Now, again, I quickly say that no one is suggesting that politicians and citizens shouldn't feel and hold on to their views with passion and strength, and we value often, it's an essence of leadership, the ability to realize that there are times when one should not compromise one's principles. I totally agree with that. But when it becomes almost a goal in itself to the detriment of making the country better, then perhaps we have a problem. Clearly, according to Senator Snow and many others these days, we do have that problem. And I have to say, the presidential campaign so far doesn't provide a lot of solace for anyone worried about public policy and public discourse. Um, fellow journalist and I were recently giving a talk and we discussing all the important issues that are not being addressed in the campaign from foreign policy to poverty and all kinds of things that we can list. Um, and those that are addressed are most often done without specificity, more by way of the kind of gotcha that we're hearing so much about, sound clips and negative ads. Um, when Paul Ryan was picked as the Republican vice presidential nominee, there was much talk that now we would have a real debate about government. You know, and, and we all know that that's alive in the country and we should probably be having that debate, its size and role. That would be an important debate to have. Again, I'm, you know, I'm just an amateur historian and observer here, but it seems that that question of the role of the individual versus or with the role of government is one of the keys to our history as a nation. Is it the individual versus government? Is it individual rights above all? Is there a public good? E pluribus unum, from the many one. But what is the one? So I don't, you know, I don't stand here with